So today we've learned, uh, we've enjoyed learning from several speakers, uh, all highlighting the intersection between invasive species and native restoration with an eye towards preparing for our future. One of the uh, impactful ways we're preparing for the future and building resiliency lies in those choices that we're making and sourcing native plant materials for restoration and landscaping. Uh, I think we all can see that in the last 20 to 25 years, there's been a new renaissance in native plant production that has emerged um, that recognizes both the impact of invasive species and the importance of considering provenance in selecting the most genetically fit and ecologically appropriate native plants. The challenge is there are many different ways of defining natives via political boundaries, terrain, and ecoregions. All of this jargon in science can be confusing. And while organizations like LIMPI and the Native Plant Trust, as well as many of our sponsors uh, joining us today, work diligently to increase the availability of ecotypic native plants, the sources of these native plants are lag lagging behind the demand. So the question is, how can you make the best choices in your landscape or restoration and why is this important? So we couldn't think of anyone more appropriate to bring this symposium home with a presentation on how local is local enough than the expert in the field on native plants, who's my friend and esteemed colleague, Uli Lormier. So Uli is the director of horticulture for the Native Plant Trust. He oversees the facilities and operations in the Garden of the Woods and Nasami Farm. Uli brings 20 years of experience working with native plants at public gardens with previous positions uh, at Brooklyn Botanic Garden, at Wave Hill Garden, and the U.S. National Arboretum. He's a tireless advocate for the use of native plants and designed uh, spaces advanced through his public speaking, writing, lectures, and media appearance, appearances. Excuse me. So I greatly admire uh, Uli's accomplishments, uh, his mentorship, uh, both for Limpy and myself, and his leadership. And I'd like to take a moment to recognize Uli's most recent accomplishment, uh, his penning of the Northeast Native Plant Primer here. Very lucky I have an advanced copy. Uh, 235 plants of Earth-Friendly Garden. So I was excited and honored to find this book in my mailbox on Monday. So thank you, Uli and have since been eagerly devouring this suddenly beautiful and comprehensive research, uh, resource that exemplifies Uli's natural ability to inspire the use and the protection of native plants by eloquently translating his knowledge into what I would call prose while showcasing his stunning uh, photographic skills, which are really truly uh, works of art in the, themselves. Uh, I'm sure that Uli will speak further about his book, but I encourage you to get your own copy, which I believe is slated to be released next week. So with that, uh, please join me in welcoming Uli Lormier on how local is local enough. So with that, Uli, I Thank turn you. it over to Thank you. Thank you very much, Polly, for that wonderful, uh, wonderful introduction. And just mm -hmm. a moment to share my screen here. Um, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, you know, uh, always when a, when a dear old friend comes calling and asking uh, if I can present at their, uh, present at their symposium, I'm happy to do so. Um, and <clears throat> um, the, the topic today, I think, is, is, is an important one, uh, as, as Polly has laid out, that um, you know, considering where things are from and certainly how things are grown uh, are increasingly important way in making good informed choices. Uh, and so I want to spend a little bit of time uh, today talking about um, <clears throat> what is provenance, why it matters, how, how it affects uh, lots of different aspects of the natural world from phenology, which is, you know, you could say is the loosely defined as the timing of biological events, but it's actually quite important insect life birds, uh, but also taking into account that context is important where you garden or where you're doing ecological restorations. And then a few comments about um, finding the right plants for those kinds of projects and how challenging that can be. So uh, to start off with, provenance is defined as the beginning of something's existence, uh, something's origin. Um, I think in the plant world, um, you know, genetic diversity and, and the adaptability of a plant are really closely tied to its provenance. In other words, that, um, you know, a, a collecting a, um, a seed from a wild population is a sampling of the overall gen genetic diversity of that population. And, and it's also uh, a sampling of that plant's ability to adapt to an ever-changing world. Um, <clears throat> 
we call an ecotype as, a, as a, a plant of known provenance and that it's uh, uniquely adapted to its source conditions. So if you uh, were to purchase plants from the uh, Limpy plant sale, um, that you would be getting a, a Long Island ecotype, a Nassau County ecotype, uh, or Atlantic Coastal Plains uh, ecoregion ecotype, meaning that it's, it's a plant that evolved in this particular region and is best adapted to those things. Um, <clears throat> one of the other definitions for provenance comes from the art world, uh, where it's, it's used to track the ownership of a person, uh, of a particular work of art or of an antique, and, uh, and, and, it's, and it's used as a way to uh, guide the authenticity or quality of this particular piece of artwork. And I think it's important to mention this too, because what that really is, is a, a way of documenting the journey that this particular artwork took. And it also underlines and emphasizes one of the most important parts about provenance is that it's documented and that information travels from this, from the source of the seed all the way through to uh, actually the physical plant or the seed itself, however it was produced. Um, but that chain of information is oftentimes broken or there are pieces missing, uh, making it really difficult for the end user, whether you're a, you know, an ecological restoration professional or a homeowner or in between, uh, to make the best informed choices for, you, uh, for your garden or for your particular project when you're not given all the information that you need. So um, <clears throat> broadly speaking, local ecotypes are adapted to environmental conditions. So that's everything from, from uh, soil, drainage, uh, geology, the, the climate conditions, it's cold hardiness, it's drought tolerance, uh, disease tolerance, all these things are, are, are wrapped into uh, you know, the, the beautiful genetic diversity and the way in which those plants express themselves and are part of a place. Um, they also, maintain existing relationships. And what this is, is that uh, is a recognition that plants sit at the base of uh, an incredibly complex web of relationships that uh, directly and indirectly affects almost all other forms of life. Um, and so, you know, we're talking about insects, pollinators, we're talking about birds, we're talking about the things that eat the insects, all the way up to the ways that affects uh, uh, us as humans uh, uh, and the food that comes to our table. Um, <clears throat> local ecotypes, when they are, when they are uh, uh, sourced from the wild, have inherently have uh, genetic diversity, particularly if they are collected with that in mind. So this isn't finding one plant and collecting every seed from it and saying that's a genetic, uh, that's a local ecotype. Uh, I think what's more important here too, as we, as we begin to wrestle with how to, uh, how to face the, the sort of twin crises of our times with climate change and the loss of biodiversity is that um, genetic diversity allows plants to be more adaptable. And I put the little asterisk in here because, um, you know, seed grown species, and, and I, I will get on a little bit of a soapbox about species uh, over cultivars of plants, um, are, are more adaptable. Um, and primarily because many cultivars of natives are grown from cuttings or they're cloned, uh, which means they already have inherently less genetic diversity than something that mother nature produced. And if cited correctly, again, you know, the adaptability of native plants uh, to, to solve difficult site conditions means that they'll generally require less resources than other kinds of plants. So, um, in asking the question of how local is local enough, uh, you also have to kind of wrestle with like, what, what do you consider native? What is, uh, uh, how, how broad a, de a definition or how narrow of a definition do you consider um, uh, as appropriate to use uh, in your particular situation? Um, some folks will say North America, and I'll show you a funny example of that later on. Um, you can say Eastern United States, uh, it can be limited to the Northeast. Um, where I worked at Brooklyn Botanic Garden, the, the, the local flora garden or the native flora garden as it's now known, had traditionally been de defined as a hundred mile radius from New York City. And I thought that was kind of curious because does that mean I couldn't include plants that were 101 miles away? And do plants really care about random numbers or political boundaries? No, they don't. Uh, and plants are much more uh, likely to be defined by ecoregions. And again, this is something that Polly had, uh, had uh, hinted at before. Um, the the ecoregion is kind of a concept that puts together 
um, all of the contributing factors that play into plant distributions. Um, and so it's soil, it's water, it's climate, it's geology, it's all those things taken in together. And what you end up with are um, these sort of amorphous regions that oftentimes span several states, but that are all united with some common character. So uh, as an example, looking at the uh, dark blue section uh, that spans the eastern parts of Massachusetts, uh, Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, Long Island, New Jersey are, are called the Atlantic Coastal Pine Barrens. And so, you know, they generally have sandier soils, they have poor nutrient soils, they're acidic, there's a, a dominant vegetation type that comes into here. And so there are some plants whose distributions are, are uh, line up very nicely with these, uh, with these larger zones. And then you have uh, more common plants that, uh, that span many of these different uh, um, Eco regions, but the idea is to say that well, you know, if you live in central Connecticut, that you should really try to source your plant material, if possible, and I put a little asterisk on that, from anywhere that's within that northeastern coastal zone, um, because those that 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 represents a local adaptation to similar site conditions from where you happen to be uh, um, executing your project or gardening. So. The ecoregion concept is, it's a little harder for folks to, to, to wrap their head around because you, everybody inherently understands state boundaries, but plants don't care um, and, and are really much more distributed by natural factors. And ecoregions aren't, they're not clean and nice. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you look at the northeastern highlands, the kind of, you know, uh, light gray, light blue, uh, sections in most of Vermont and New Hampshire, you've got a big blob of the Adirondacks in upstate New York, and then a little blob in the Catskills, a little further down, and then a small finger that reaches through northern New Jersey uh, into sections of the Poconos uh, uh, in, in, into Pennsylvania. So, um, you know, from a natural history standpoint, these make sense. From a political boundary standpoint, it, it's a harder, harder concept to grasp. But uh, a lot of practitioners think this is a really important thing to get out into the public's eye to start understanding that plants don't line up in the way that we arrange the country in terms of states and counties and so forth. So <clears throat> where plants are from and provenance and, and species, uh, are, are, are these, these, these two different concepts are really, really closely linked. Um, they've co-evolved with lots of different organisms. Uh, again, this, this entire choreography and timing of when plants emerge, when plants uh, flower, when those resources are available to insects, when they can begin interacting with one another, are all closely tied to a place. Um, and uh, pollination is, a, is another great example of this, that, um, you know, we have, we have lots of, of generalist pollinators, and we have a number of specialist pollinators, and I'll talk a little bit about that as well. And then all, all how that all connects in with, with birds and animals and things that we like to see and foster in our gardens. So as a way to kind of look at this, um, I thought I'd pull together a fun little list about growing degree days. And so what these are are average days above freezing uh, in various places across the Eastern seaboard. Um, and what this is kind of a proxy for is uh, uh, how long it takes for, for example, spring ephemerals to emerge in places like Orlando, where it's pretty much never below freezing, in Charleston. Uh, what's interesting is that Philadelphia and New York City have longer days above freezing than somewhere like R Richmond, Virginia. And then you've got, uh, and I chalk that up to either the you know, urban heat island effect or uh, its proximity to the oceans, which is more, has more of a, a tempering effect on climate. Uh, where I garden now in Framingham has a mere 175 days, five and a half months above freezing. So, you know, we're just beginning to see spring emerging right now. Uh, if you go all the way further north into, into Bangor, Maine, for example, it's even shorter. But the point I'm making here is that uh, if you were to source plants that were grown in Charleston or from Charleston and plant them here in Framingham, those plants would struggle uh, 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 to adapt to a much shorter season and the timing would be off. And this is really one of the big concerns about using plant material that is not local, uh, is that it has this kind of cascade of effects uh, on, on other lives and it, and it disrupts those, uh, those very carefully orchestrated relationships. So 
again, we're talking about pollinators here, for example. So this is just a sampling of, of uh, the kinds of things that showed up on one day on some Menarda fistulosa here in the garden. Um, you know, this interaction uh, uh, between plants and insects in this kind of more simplified sense is incredibly important for the survival and adaptability of both groups. You know, for plants, the end is poll of pollination is to produce seed and that passes on adaptations and it's a greater chance for survival. For insects, it's about uh, uh, the, the resources they need to breed successfully, which then in turn passes on adaptations and a greater chance for survival into the future. If you expand that out into a more of a habitat sense, look that the, the, the richer, the more varied and, and rich uh, species uh, assemblages are, uh, it really uh, uh, um, it, it, it increases pollinator conservation. In other words, that the, the more species rich you have, the more chances there are for plant pollinator interactions and that increases the availability of plant-based foods and shelters for other kinds of organisms and it works all the way up uh, all the way up the, the trophic levels uh, all the way to um, you know our, our lovely red-tailed hawk here disemboweling a squirrel that most certainly fed on some native plants. Um, but again getting back to that timing idea um, you know here's an example of a, of a, of a specialist uh, the spring beauty mining bee uh, where this, this uh, uh, delightful little insect ha has to have spring beauties available in order for it to be able to, to reproduce successfully, uh, in order for it to pollinate this plant. And if it doesn't time the emergence of, of, of itself out of, the, out of the earth at the same time as these things coming into bloom, there's a mismatch and this, both species suffer. Um, you know, Milkweeds is another example. Everybody understands milkweeds as the poster child for, for uh, monarchs and monarch butterflies. And I've chosen to show a couple of, of sort of non-traditional uh, milkweeds here to show that there are more than just butterfly milkweed and common milkweed and swamp milkweed, that we have other ones uh, that are really wonderful and that they're also host for other organisms like milkweed tussock moths and dogbane beetles. Uh, you know, these are wonderful little insects that have figured out how to deal with the toxic compounds that are found inside of milkweed leaves. And of course, the monarch that everybody understands uh, is, is, is a really wonderful tight relationship. And when these guys migrate north, they're counting on flowers and plants being in bloom and available in order for them to, uh, to uh, um, begin the second and third and fourth generations of their lives before returning back south uh, in, in the winter. Uh, another specific example here, uh, colonies and, and uh, the uh, white turtle head. Uh, not only is it delightful to watch bumblebees struggle to get inside, but this plant is one of the sole hosts for the Baltimore checker spot. Uh, so if you wanna see these, Beautiful caterpillars, which also, by the way, feed lots of birds. And you want to see this guy, you have to have the right kind of plant and a species of plant at that in place. And these relationships extend beyond pollinators to sort of the next level up. We have predators that hang out in flowers waiting for pollinators. Um, uh, to, so, you're, so you're not just supporting, you know, pretty bees and butterflies, but crab spiders, uh, goldenrod crab spiders. You can see a bumblebee victim in the back here. This organism in the span of three to five days can change its color from white to yellow to completely match inside of a, a, a goldenrod flower. It's absolutely amazing. So um, many of us are uh, familiar with dietary restrictions. I have a niece and a nephew who both have celiac disease. And so I very keenly understand uh, gluten allergies, um, but, for pollen specialists, it's kind of the same thing. They have dietary restrictions. They've co-evolved with specific plants that fulfill their nutritional needs. And local provenance against here supports these local specialists. These plants will also support the generalist pollinators as well. But again, species diversity is what's really crucial here. Uh, and so it's not just using a cultivar or what's available, it's going for species. Many of these are solitary nesting. And they're particularly sensitive to climate change and sensitive to lack of their preferred species. So imagine you had celiac disease and all you could eat was wheat bread. You wouldn't, it wouldn't be very happy and you wouldn't last very long if you were that way. So the following that I'm going to kind of flash through fairly quickly 
are plants that support pollen specialists in a number of different groups. And just to show you that your options are not limited here if you're looking at this from the designer's eye. Um, in the carrot family, you have your golden alexanders. The aster family is full of really beautiful plants, everything from boltonia, wood asters, world asters, bog asters. Uh, um, we've got black-eyed Susans, coreopsis, sunflowers, blazing stars, other asters, thistles, sneezeweed, ironweed. All of these things are great to support specialist pollinators in addition to uh, 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 generalist pollinators. Goldenrods for days. We have lots of wonderful goldenrod species. All of them offer something special to specialists. Joe pie weeds, uh, beggars, ticks, and bidens, um, pacaras and groundsels, campanulas. We've got uh, uh, different uh, campanulas and campanulastrums. The heath family is full of wonderful plants, beautiful shrubs uh, that all offer uh, particular resources to specialists. Uh, and of course, who doesn't like blueberries and cranberries and trailing arbutus? Uh, for the mint family, you've got your, your uh, wild bergamots and Oswego tea, spotted horse mints. Um, not to forget about our local and native loose stripes, not the invasive loose stripes, but these are important resources for sweat bees and oil mining bees that gather waxy uh, uh, substances off these flowers uh, for their life cycles. Rose family members. Saxifrage is here, good for woodland situations. Um, Scrofularias, pensamins, uh, agalinus, verbenaceae, and of course, violets. I love violets. They're such a cheerful little group. Uh, they're diverse, they're colorful. They grow in lots of different situations. They're easy to weed out. And I think an often really important, uh, uh, an overlooked group of plants, uh, at least from the design standpoint. Then we have plants for, uh, uh, pollinators that have short and, and medium length tongues. Again, so we're kind of looking at what kind of plants are important from the insect perspective, rather than saying, here are some plants and let, maybe a bee shows up on it and I'm happy. So your milkweeds, uh, bush honeysuckles and button bushes, uh, spiked lobelias, nectars for long tongues. So now we're seeing flowers that have tubular shapes. Uh, everything from agastaches and baptisias to annuals like wild phlox. Uh, false obedient plants, jewel weed. Many people think of this as a weed, but it, it will bring in hummingbirds just as much as it will bring in uh, bees that have long tongues and long enough to access that beautiful little nectar spur in the back. Um, short and medium tongue pollen plants. So here you have all of your St. John's warts that are really important. Willows are really great because they bloom early and not only are they wind pollinated, but they're also insect pollinated. So uh, uh, willows are a really important group of this as well. And so, as you can imagine, and I really love this as a slide, and it's, it's an older one, but it really talks about the intersection of so many migratory birds and shorebirds and waterfowl and land birds uh, that come through the Northeast. And all of these birds, 96% of these birds, require insects to successfully rear their young. They may eat seeds later on in the season. They may sup on nectar here and there, but primarily their diet consists of insects in the spring and fruits and so forth later on in the season. And having plants that are uh, of local provenance in all of these different places ensures that the timing of their arrival coincides with the timing of the resource that they need to fuel themselves on their incredible journeys. Uh, this was a really wonderful study, just as an example uh, from Desiree Narango, uh, who studied Carolina chickadees, uh, finding that they preferred to nest in yards that had primarily native vegetation. The most best performing uh, 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 plants were tree species, oaks, cherries, elms, and maples. And I find this fact absolutely astounding. They need between six to 9,000 caterpillars in a season to raise a brood of five chicks. And what other groups support that uh, amount of biomass and, and, and uh, diversity in insect life than native trees and shrubs. Uh, and if you don't believe me, pick up one of Doug Tallamy's books and uh, read it because um, there, it, it's, it's, what I'm trying to do here is, is kind of connecting these pieces and putting together that the, the local plants support local insects that then can support 
the migratory birds and year-round residents and all these things fit together uh, and are all the, the, the glue for all of these di different interactions is the plants. So context is important, okay? If you garden in a highly fragmented urban environment, uh, um, and I, I hate to say this, but that, you know, the provenance becomes a little less important. Um, whereas if you are gardening or doing restorations in rural environments that are near wild remnant populations, then you need to be more careful about where you source from your material because that will, in, it will inevitably interact with local populations. I also think it's important to state that at least for home gardeners, using cultivars is not wrong. Uh, I think that 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 we we turn more people off in, in terms of the native plant movement by browbeating folks into saying they're doing it wrong if they're not only if they're not using uh, a species specific uh, uh, you know locally grown seed seed source known seed provenance uh, material uh, you turn more people away that way than saying okay like you know if you can get a cultivar that's great it's a step in the right direction we need more research too and this is the uh, uh, I, I, I put this particular image on here on purpose because one of my colleagues did her doctoral thesis on this plant and showed that common milkweed across a large geographic range had a surprisingly low degree of genetic diversity. And knowing this information means that if you're specifying common milkweed for a restoration project, its provenance might not be as important in terms of being local than uh, say swamp milkweed, the other species that she studied, that showed it had a high degree of genetic diversity, and that diversity showed uh, was was tied to you know geographic locations. In which case, using swamp milkweed, it would be important to source it from as local as possible. But again, that's one example of one species amongst the you know three thousand plus natives that are in our region. So we need more research, most certainly. So I'd like to put this out here, which is to say, um, it, you know, as a kind of preamble to finding the right plants that, you know, using a known invasive plant is bad. No, worst option. Boo, shame on you. If you haven't learned anything from today's conference, uh, don't do it. Um, there are non-native plants that play nice. You know, and this idea of, of aiming for 70% native in your garden allows for you to keep the peony or the plant that you got from your grandmother or, or you know, uh, allows for that. A good option might be a cultivar selection of something that's native to the Eastern United States. Better if it's ecoregion appropriate. And the best option, of course, if you can get it, is seed grown, known provenance, and appropriate to your ecoregion. But how do you get those plants? And I think this is, again, one of the bigger disconnects that, that, that Polly spoke about, and that is you can attend these conferences and, 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 and get these really compelling presentations about why you should be using uh, species and, and plants of known provenance, but then you have a really hard time finding them in any kind of commercial or retail market. And, and there's reasons for that. Uh, native plant sales are a fraction of total nursery sales in the United States. And yes, they are growing more popular and that number is getting higher and higher, but as Polly said in the introduction, the demand right now is far outstripping the ability to provide and meet that demand with the right kinds of plants. Um, what drives that is basically the availability of it, uh, consumer preference that most people still only think of gardens in terms of aesthetics and what they want that is something that's pretty and just overall knowledge of native plants. And add to that, you have aggressive and misleading marketing, poor labels on plants, uh, and all of it really amounts to uh, almost an intentional misinformation that, you know, they don't want you to be an informed consumer. You'll buy what they give you. Um, Mount Cuba conducted a, a survey of mid-Atlantic regional wholesale nurseries and discovered that three quarters of what they offer were non-native ornamentals. And this is important because wholesale nurseries are the places where um, the folks go that landscape the corporate parks, the shopping center malls, these sort of larger, larger scale landscapes uh, that we're faced with every day. Um, and of the, the, the scant quarter that were considered native, again, only a quarter of those, less of those were straight species, meaning, again, three quarters of that were cultivars and hybrids. And because of the way in which wholesale nurseries operate, uh, and they buy in liners from other places, um, that, that 
that link in information between the source of the seed to the end user is broken because they don't know or they don't care enough to track the information. So native species uh, in, in terms of species uh, are hard because the markets are localized. The nurseries that specialize it tend to be smaller. They can't, they can't scale up at, 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 at to, to, to a degree to meet the demand. Um, seed is a, a huge bottleneck. The availability of seed uh, is high demand and short supply. So these are all things that, that, that uh, are, are working against us. And in the end, you know, if, if you go to, from the retail standpoint, why didn't, more, why didn't they sell more? It's because not enough people asked for it. And I think this is, again, something, if anything, you can come away with is, you know, ask good questions at your local nursery and demand to know where things are from and ask for that information to fill in those gaps where it's missing. Um, just quickly, as a, as a case study in terms of, of, of misleading marketing, uh, I present to you the Sugar Buzz series of, uh, of Menardas. They come right out of the Midwest. They have wonderful names that I think are more appropriate for a candy store or maybe a Baskin Robbins than necessarily a plant store. But when you log on to their website and look for their information, this is what you get. Origin, native to North America. Well, gee, thanks. That's really great. That's good information for me. It's bee friendly. Um, well, is it a honeybee? Is it a bumblebee? Does it, does it support local uh, specialists or generalists? Like all this information is missing from what you're being fed through these. Uh, uh, and all of these as patented plants are all clones. So they're already genetically less diverse than working with species plants. But just as a kind of a taste of what it is that, that consumers face in trying to find out the right information and helping them make decisions about what is best for their garden. So cultivars, again, uh, where the desired traits that, have, that we may be altering leaf chemistry. So if we have uh, plants where the leaves are darker than what the species are, if we make changes to the shape and color and timing of the flower. We don't know what that's doing to the quality of the pollen or nectar that's available. Um, people love double flowered things, but from an ecological standpoint, it's a dead end. They are not they're not useful for any organisms. Conversely, how do the insects interact with the cultivars? Well, for the most part, um, unless the foliage has been negatively changed, uh, negatively cha unless the foliage has been changed drastically to purple or red or blue, um, the insects that eat plants don't seem to mind if it's a shorter habit, if it's got bigger fruit, if it's disease uh, resistant or whatever, that doesn't really matter. Um, other research here from Dr. Annie White that compares species and cultivars of species for pollinator visitation and preference showed that in general, pollinators prefer species, but there were some exceptions. Uh, Veronicastrum was greatly preferred. This particular cultivar was preferred over the species. So it's not a straight and linear answer, but yet most of these plants are the result of breeding programs that, that uh, um, that prize aesthetics over ecological value. And I'm waiting for breeders to make plants that have more nectar or more quality of that, you know, breed plants for ecological value rather than just being pretty. So her suggestions essentially were stick with plants that were seed grown and try to avoid hybrids and cultivars that have been drastically altered from the original species that co-evolved in nature with these insects. In the shrub world, again, uh, we have some, a paper from Yukon uh, that is comparing uh, native shrubs and cultivars of shrubs. Uh, in general, uh, that uh, uh, um, the pollinators preferred the species over the cultivars. There were some exceptions. So for example, bees uh, seem to like the, high, the, 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 the cultivars of clethra just as much as they did the species. And flies seem to really like Monlo Diablo over the, uh, the species Physocarpus. Their conclusions were kind of a wash. Uh, native shrub and cultivars are not less or more attractive. It must be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think it's worth kind of pointing out that the authors of this particular study also had a hand in creating Yukon groundhog and Yukon lowscape mound, and they'll probably have a vested interest in not saying that their you know, shrub breeding uh, 
is resulting in, in less ecological value than the species are. But uh, as far as research out there to support this question, there's not, there's, there's very little out there. So what I'll leave you with is this, um, try to aim for 70% native if you can. Um, if you can find seed grown known provenance plants, they are the best option that's available. But I fully recognize that it's hard to get those uh, for a number of reasons. Um, embrace species diversity. You know, if you have one goldenrod, plant six other species of goldenrods because you're, you're gonna be supporting those specialists and so forth, uh, looking at uh, uh, leaving things messy. This is another thing, again, uh, maybe a subject for an entirely separate talk, but our obsession with tidy landscapes uh, is not great for ecology. Um, poor soils are a gift. Uh, you don't need to amend things. Uh, Many natives don't want to grow in the same soils that you grow your tomatoes and vegetables in. And of course, ask questions when you buy plants. Ask about provenance, ask about whether things were grown with pesticides or not, uh, and share your knowledge. This is the, this is the way that, that we encourage the broader public to begin moving the needle towards the right direction in our, in our estimation. So with that, I will end my remarks and say thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer questions. Um, your choices do matter. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Uli. That was fantastic. And I hope everyone has some inspiration and some ideas based on that information that uh, Uli has provided. Um, we do have a couple of questions. Um, Uli, the, the one in the chat or in the Q&A is quite long. Um, yeah. Do you want me to read it or you want me to read it? What's your preference? Um, I can start with that one. I'll read out the question. So uh, Teresa writes, I got the impression from earlier speakers that we should consider planting tree species from further south in order to create forests that will be resilient to climate change. How would you balance phenotypic and ecological concerns against climate change resilience when it comes to long-lived species? Is it possible that we should begin considering this uh, with regard to shorter-lived plants or do you think our local plants have robust genetic variability that will allow them to adapt gradually? So this is actually a really great question because it's one that I've, that I've gotten several times. And uh, my answer is this. So I think that um, climate change uh, as we understand it is not necessarily a question only of things growing warmer. It's also shifts in precipitation patterns. And what this means is that, that as forest species shift, some are moving on a north-south axis and others are moving on an east-west axis. In other words, things that prefer it drier may be moving further west and things that like it wetter as New England and Northeast continues to have wetter springs and wetter summers that we're beginning to see species moving further east in response to that. Um, so I, I am not of the camp that says that we should be rushing to plant willow oaks and live oaks and other things up here now because computer models suggest that in 50 years, Long Island's climate will look like Virginia or Georgia or North Carolina. I also really believe that, uh, that the uh, uh, genetic variability and robust genetic variability as Teresa has, has, has suggested, um, has to be given a chance to adapt. There will be winners, there will be losers. Um, you know, in, a, a, as we look at uh, um, how invasive species have expanded their range thanks to uh, all of the human-made uh, uh, disruptions and disturbance patterns, um, there are also native plants that are expanding their ranges as well. Um, so things like pin oak and black cherry uh, and some of the sumac species are taking advantage of these new ecological opportunities. What we will potentially lose are things that are already on their way uh, uh, and things that don't have, that aren't, uh, they don't have the ability to change fast enough. And so these are uh, things like orchids and lilies that uh, in addition to uh, um, the sort of their, the slow response that they're showing to climate change, there are also groups that happen to be particularly hammered by deer herbivory and other things. So, you know, those are things that, that are potentially uh, we're looking to lose. But um, I think again, that uh, sourcing locally keeps the, those local adaptations in place and 
and, and positions those plants a much better way to, uh, um, to adapt to, to climate change than introducing something that's never been up here before and thinking that we can garden the wild. Uh, I think that that's, I think that's it's hubris to think that. Um, and I think it also is a disservice to um, the thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of years of evolution that have brought us to the local genetics that we enjoy right now here in the Northeast. So um, longleaf, uh, and, and I, I say that my answer for that is the same, whether it's longleaf species or short-lived short -lived species. You know, shorter lived ones, certainly they, they, they change on a faster pace because their lives are shorter and the adaptations are passed around shorter. Um, but uh, I don't think that we, that, uh, that we need to be planting it. And, you know, and I may be contradicting uh, um, for the uh, previous speakers here, um, but, you know, conferences where everybody agrees is kind of boring. Like you want a little <laughs> disagreement and saying, well, he says something different. He's got good ideas and so forth. So hopefully that will generate some good uh, discussion out of this uh, uh, and some, some different perspectives, hopefully, res respectfully to the other speakers. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's great that every, you know, everybody's exposed to these different concepts uh, and practices. Um, Uli, the next question, have there been studies on cultivars being allowed to reproduce on their own in their native range? And if so, do they revert back to species characteristics? Um, well, I mean, so this is, this is, again, also an interesting question that, um, you know, I put it this way, that, that the science has not kept pace with what's happening out on, on the ground. Uh, and that we have planted cultivars into gardens uh, and, and adjacent to wild spaces for quite some time now. And there's not good research right now, at least that I'm aware of, um, that is, is trying to quantify what happens with the gene flow from those plants into wild populations and vice versa. And if enough time passes, will there be some reversion to an original state or not? Uh, I mean, it really depends on the degree of genetic diversity, how those plants are propagated when they come out, where's the source material from. I mean, it's really confusing. Uh, some cultivars are direct selections from the wild and that state, they come true from seed. Others are things that were selected for in a trial bed for a particular characteristic and then cloned and patented in order to maintain that characteristic. Uh, and what happens when you stop doing that uh, is, is not really well studied. So uh, I think that that is uh, you know, another area where the science has not kept pace with, with practice in every day. And there are examples as well where, uh, especially in grasslands and using cultivars, uh, switchgrass and big blue stem, where they're super competitive and out competing the straight line species of uh, the ecotypes that otherwise uh, are native to our grasslands. Um, you can see phenological differences in the panicle and switchgrass of the cultivars and, um, and also different coloration. Um, and I think it's heavy metal, um, a cultivar out of switchgrass out of North Carolina. So there is definitely documented evidence of um, cultivars out competing the native species in our grasslands when they are used uh, in that proximity or becoming so abundant that you have a monotypic stand of those grasses and the forbs are not able to persist. So uh, there's definitely plenty of anecdotal in, uh, in incidences of that occurring as well. Um, next questions. I use common and daisy flea banes here, which I keep at a certain percentage. Do native gardeners avoid them? Um, they are the favorite plants of native bees that frequent here, good or bad? Uh, I like daisy flea banes, uh, and uh, but I think that it's it's important to um, contextualize these plants, and I think that um, we th there's there's a danger of labeling native plants as invasive um, and and comparing them with true invasive plants, uh, and it's not their fault because they're good at producing lots of seed. I would say that. Common and daisy flea banes are what are called ruderal plants and things that really move into, you know, early, early, like early successional habitats, things that have just recently been uh, 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 disturbed. And because of their ability to seed in everywhere, a lot of gardeners don't like them because they, they think they become weedy. 
Um, and so again, if you, if you keep that information uh, uh, in context, um, you know, would, would using common and daisy fleabane in a small garden be a great idea? I'd probably say no, because there's a great chance that it will overwhelm other plantings. But on a larger scale, it should absolutely be part of, uh, part of the, the species assemblage um, because it does bloom earlier in the, in the, in, you know, um, in the season uh, and it provides important floral resources for pollinators at that time. Uh, one of my other favorites is Robin's plantain, Origeron uh, pulchellus. Um, which is a great ground cover when it's not grow when it's not flowering. Beautiful larger flowers. Uh, just to throw out there that there are other flea banes out there besides, uh, you know, um, common and daisy flea bane. Great. Um, so one uh, individual thanked you for your presentation and said trying to explain these concepts to the homeowner is always hard enough. Is uh, and is really gets to the point. Um, is this information available on the Native Plant Trust website? Um, not so much on the website. We, I, I do offer a class um, that's called Native Species Cultivars and Hybrids, uh, where I get into much more detail about this particular issue, uh, about, uh, about the, uh, um, you know, the, the definitions, why, why there's so many choices out on the market, um, and how to sort of navigate all of that uh, in the best way possible. Again, I feel like uh, there's a lot of information that's missing for people. Uh, I don't know, I can't say that it's that, you know, the nursing industry wants people to be uninformed, mm -hmm. but how it almost feels that way. Um, and, and again, that, that link, that, that documentation, if you think of it from the art world, you know, the provenance information and what makes it a good quality seed is just missing. And it's one of the huge challenges that, uh, that I think native plant uh, enthusiasts have to navigate. Great. Is there a central resource for cultivars that have been deemed less or more favorable for pollinators? No, not that I'm aware of. And, and finding this information was uh, incredibly difficult. Um, and if you think about uh, a, a, a a, a database that, that would rank cultivars from a capitalist standpoint, if yours was ranked lowly, you wouldn't be too happy about it because nobody would buy your plant anymore. Uh, so there's also the economics of this that, that go into play. And also the idea that just because somebody made a new cultivar doesn't mean that it's necessarily a better garden plant. Many of these are not tested thoroughly enough before being released out into the environment. Um, and just as much as finding out information about how plants were grown, where they were, I had to, I had to dig through patent applications for, for many hours to find out propagation information and source information for some of these cultivars. So it's buried and hard to get at. And like I said, likely intentionally. Perfect. Uh, two more questions. Do you believe that we should once again, one, once again, place greater emphasis on open pollination in plant breeding? Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, this, this is a, another point that I, that I sometimes make that, you know, I, I can be pretty harsh on the, on the nursery industry, sort of, uh, uh, especially the industrial scale nursery industry for their obsession with aesthetics. But the other side of the coin is that many landscape designers and gardeners feed into that by demanding uh, uh, you know, uniform and consistent characteristics in their designs and saying, yes, I want all these plants to be the same height to flower at the same time. So it fits into my aesthetic vision of this. And so the nursery industry has responded by providing lots of cultivars that do exactly that. They're clones of one another. Um, and so, yes, we need to, we need to reward nurseries that, that uh, cherish uh, and, and try to preserve local ecotypes and that, that work with local provenance, that use open pollination uh, and that really, uh, and other sorts of ecologically forward propagation practices. Um, you know, there, there's again, completely separate topic here, whether or not this approach is scalable to meet the demand. 
Um, you know, it's sort of the same thing with small scale organic farms that uh, they can produce beautiful produce, um, but can it be done on a scale large enough to feed 400 million people in this country? I don't know. Um, so it's sort of a similar challenge in terms of scope and scale when you look at seed grown things, but absolutely, Joseph, I agree with you 100%. And then Denise had a comment, the ecoregion for Suffolk County, uh, the Pine Barrens, the Atlantic Coastal Pine Barrens ecoregion 84 is not accurate for the North Shore. So do you want to address that? Would you like me to address that? You can address that one. That, <laughs> sure. that map was, was from, from my new book uh, in trying to, to distill the concept without putting a map that was so busy with finer details. Uh, again, really trying just to... Um, to introduce the, co the concept to folks. The, the, the book that, that uh, Polly introduced in the beginning uh, is really aimed at non-professionals and to encourage people who are interested in using native plants um, to begin doing so and to begin being exposed to, you know, something that as, as, as people all, who have all already drunk the Kool-Aid here in, in native plant conferences understand, uh, um, you know, trying to present that in a way that, that is accessible. Um, and so I couldn't have a map that was entirely busy. Uh, and so I acknowledge the inaccuracy, um, but um, also defend it. But I, I, I'd add to that too, is that those ecoregion maps are rough estimate. They, they are put together at a larger scale based on um, unground truth soil maps and topographic maps that have been um, delineated um, without that ground truthing. So not only uh, perhaps is that boundary inaccurate along the North Shore, but I also believe that it should extend into uh, the Hempstead Plains rather than being the Hempstead Plains being part of Ecoregion 59. So you know when you're thinking conceptually about the ecoregion, it's a guiding principle. It's a, it's a tool in our toolbox to help better inform our use and selection of native plant materials. And when I say selection, actually choosing which plant materials, not selecting a particular species of a cultivar. Um, so the last question that I wanted to add on is to put Uli a little bit more in the hot seat and tell us a little bit more about your book, where it's available, when we can find it, when it's available, sure. and sure, sure. Um, if there's a preferential source that would be uh, most beneficial to helping to support the Native Plant Trust. Yes. So. Um, the official publication date is actually May 10th, uh, so it, it, uh, it, it's not quite available yet, um, and it is uh, published by Timber Press. Um, you can pre-order it if you visit our uh, Native Plant Trust website. Uh, put that in, into the chat here, um, and um, you can explore the website as well. We have lots of other great resources there. And then under um, uh, books or buying plants, um, there'll be a link to pre-order. Um, you can also buy it through Amazon, but I will say that um, buying it through us supports us rather than uh, a company that really doesn't need more of your money. Um, so please consider ordering through us. Um, I will be doing some sort of you know, book tours and so forth coming out uh, uh, in, in the coming months. Um, so please stay tuned um, to wherever you find out uh, about these sorts of things. Um, and yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, um, it's kind of a culmination of, of many years of photography and work and uh, I'm incredibly proud of it. And uh, I'm excited to share it with, uh, with, the, with the wider audience. So. Um, would be very happy if you all bought a copy and told you <laughs> about it. Thank you. So you will not be disappointed in uh, this great reference. So, um, but I want to thank Uli for your time uh, and sharing your expertise and vast knowledge. Um, it really brings today's program to a close. Um, I'd like to Final, do the final reminder here that if you're seeking DEC pesticide applicator credits, uh, you must type your name into the chat before we leave this session. Uh, if you're seeking DEC or LACES credits, um, please fill out the survey. We do also ask those in attendance to also fill out the survey so that we have some great feedback on this program so we can improve the program moving forward. We'd like to take a second for uh, Abby and Haley to please turn their camera on 
um, and Bill if he's in this session. But I wanted to recognize um, particularly Abby and Haley and Bill uh, taking the lead in coordinating um, the Invasive and Native Plant Conference, uh, especially remotely on a new platform. Um, they, uh, along with the Olympia Board of Directors, have led the steering committee and uh, gotten out the a prompting stick on many occasions to keep us on task and in line and having this program delivered. So uh, a big uh, thank you to um, Ailey and Abby, especially Abby. Abby was the leader of the pack and, and Bill as well, as well as the other LISMA staff that we've recently hired to help with education and outreach. Um, and graphic promotions. So I uh, also would be remiss if I didn't uh, thank all of our speakers. Uh, without your knowledge and expertise, we wouldn't have a program. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to seeing the additional presentations and research that you continue to advance and in Lily's case, books that you continue to publish. Um, a special acknowledgement to our sponsors, especially DEC who provided the seed money to help us initiate the coordination of this joint conference this year, as well as the nurseries, the seed producers, uh, the industry professionals, and the nonprofit organizations, all of which continue uh, to help support the development, um, driving the demand and the development of native plant materials. Um, I think we all can really recognize that um, as a land limited island, right? We're innately land limited facing climate change. It's imperative that we all work together uh, to continue to be, build resilience in our ecosystems in a strategic, bleh, excuse me, in a strategic, progressive, and collaborative way. Um, we really hope that you leave today with a diversity of knowledge, tools, and resources that will help you continue to preserve, protect, and enhance uh, the resilience of Long Island. And with that, I hope everyone has a good evening. Um, this program is been recorded and we will have it up on our website, uh, both the LISMA and the LIMPI website uh, in the coming week. So uh, again, thank you for everyone that's attended to all of our sponsors, speakers, and, and all of you um, that helped put this program together. So have a good evening. <laughs>